Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for coming today. Uh, my name is Mike Breen. I'm the new vice president of the Truman National Security Project. And on behalf of Truman, we want to say just how excited we are to be co-sponsoring this event with NDN here today uh, and cooperating with NDN in other ways. Uh, three of your top staffers here, Sam DuPont, Jake Berliner, and Alicia Menendez, are members of Truman's partnership program and our political leadership training program. And so we're very happy to be here with NDN working to reimagine the future of American foreign policy together. Today's speaker will address a, a topic that, that's very close to me and very close to, I think, many of you, uh, the, the decade-long history and longer history of our struggle with al-Qaeda and its allies. Um, in reading his excellent book, uh, The Longest War, just fresh off the New York Times bestseller list, congratulations, um, it, it took me back to a time in 2005 and 2006 when I was leading a small team of American soldiers in, uh, in Afghanistan on the afghan pak border. About 200 of us were trying to secure the better part of a province that was saturated with Taliban fighters at the time. And I remember after one particularly fierce engagement, um, standing there with my radio operator in our command center calling for air support, expecting to be denied, being denied, uh, being told that there were no aircraft available to come to our aid. And my radio operator, a 19-year-old kid, looked at me and goes, sir, where the hell's the Air Force? And I said, you know, hey, you know, I'm sorry, Marine, but the Air Force is in Iraq. And he looked at the mountains and looked at Pakistan on the other side, and he asked me, you know, Al-Qaeda's on the other side of that mountain. What the hell is the Air Force doing in Iraq? Our guest today is, you know, someone who can answer that question, I think, better than many of us, uh, better than almost anyone. Uh, Peter Bergen is that rare journalist who has the courage to follow the story anywhere it might lead, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, countless other places, again and again. He has the insight to see the story when he's there and to understand what's happening in front of him when so many do not. Uh, and he has the skill and the courage to come back and lay it out for the rest of us, uh, as he has in his latest book, The Longest War, uh, and in two previous books, um, Holy War Incorporated and the Osama bin Laden, I know. Uh, Peter Bergen is a print and television journalist, as I've said. He's the director of the National Security Program at the New America Foundation, a research fellow at New York University Center on Law and Security, and CNN's National Security Analyst. So please join me in welcoming Peter Bergen. Thank you, thank you for that introduction, and thank you, uh, Simon Rosenberg and, and NDM for this invitation, and to, and to you all for coming out. Um, I know you have many other things to do. Um, I'm going to talk for 15, 20 minutes. Obviously, a, you know, a, a book about the longest war covers a lot of ground, and so there's no way I can um, try and summarize the book, but rather I will just uh, try and talk about some things that are in the news right now that relate to some of the themes of the book. Uh, one of the big themes of the book is the extent to which, I mean, one was very interesting to me that um, when you look at the protesters in Egypt or Bahrain or Libya, um, they're not carrying pictures of Osama bin Laden. They're not spouting uh, al-Qaeda's venomous anti-Western rhetoric. Uh, they're not burning American flags or Israeli flags, which is almost pro forma for these for, you know, in that part of the world when there are protests. And al-Qaeda's ideas have got absolutely nothing to do with what's going on. And I think Osama bin Laden, sitting in his well-appointed uh, house in the northwest frontier of, pa of, of, pa of Pakistan, would probably be looking at this with a mixture of glee and despair. Glee because, after all, the overthrow of the Mubarak regime is absolutely central to al-Qaeda's plan, and, and despair because it's got nothing to do with his ideas, his people, and the outcomes are not going to be to his satisfaction because no one is clamoring for a Taliban-style theocracy in Egypt. Sure, the Muslim Brotherhood will play an important role in Egypt going forward, but they are not uh, as of yet, and I don't think they will impose some sort of Taliban, they neither will nor they can impose some sort of Taliban regime in Egypt. And so one of the themes of the book is that Al-Qaeda uh, is losing the war of ideas in the Muslim world, not because we're winning them, certainly, that was always a very naive view of how such wars are won, but because Al-Qaeda is losing them. And if you look at public opinion polling on the subject of Al-Qaeda, bin Laden, or suicide bombing in countries from Indonesia to, to Morocco, bin Laden's support has just been tanking for many years. And why is that? Well, for, for four reasons that again relate to what's going on in the Middle East today, I think, in some shape or form. First of all, 
al-Qaeda has been killing a lot of Muslim civilians for a group that positions itself as the defender of Islam. And when I say al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda and its allies. Uh, this is not impressive. Um, and Muslims are, uh, are well understand now that the same ideological virus that unleashed the 9-11 attacks is the same ideological virus that's killing people in Riyadh and Jeddah as, as, as al-Qaeda did in 2003, killing people in Amman as al-Qaeda did in 2005, killing people in Jakarta as al-Qaeda's affiliate there, Jamaa Islamiyah did in uh, 2002, 2003, and again in 2009, killing people in Bali as al-Qaeda's affiliate did in 2002 and 2005. And in fact, West Point's done an absolutely fascinating um, investigation of Arab language news accounts of uh, attacks in the Middle East, terrorist attacks that kill civilians. And they found, based on just looking at Arab language news accounts of these attacks, uh, that the Arab language accounts said that overwhelmingly the casualties uh, were Muslim civilians. And of course, Iraq was the principal place where this was happening, where uh, there were more suicide attacks in Iraq in one country between 2003 and 2007 than had happened uh, between 1981 and, and 2003 all around the world. Uh, at least uh, a thousand suicide attacks and so many of these suicide attacks were carried out of course by Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And so that was the first problem that Al-Qaeda has. It's, it's killing a lot of mu Muslim civilians and this is now well understood in the Muslim world. The second problem it has of course is it is not offering anything positive. We know what bin, bin Laden is against but what's he really for? If he was here and you asked him, what are you trying to do? He would say the restoration of the caliphate, which by the way is not, I mean, the restoration of the caliphate is not the restoration of the Ottoman Empire uh, as it uh, existed before 1924. That is not what bin Laden means. He means the imposition of Taliban style theocracies in Indonesia and Morocco. Um, and very few Muslims want to live in a, in, a, in a utopia as imagined by the Taliban. And particularly there's nothing like living under the Taliban as a prophylactic for not wanting them back in Afghanistan uh, only 10% of the population in any number of polls taken since 2005 have a favorable view of the Taliban. And so these groups, Al-Qaeda and its allies, are not offering anything positive. Uh, they have, there's no Al-Qaeda hospital, social welfare service. Uh, there's no Al-Qaeda plan to bring the tens of millions of men uh, in the Middle East who are unemployed to work. Uh, so we know what they, they're, they're offering only violence and essentially uh, the promise of the Taliban rule uh, in, in, in every Muslim country. The third sort of strategic problem these groups have is that they've made a world of enemies, which is never a winning strategy. Uh, whether it's every government in the Middle East, Russia, China, India, the United States, NATO, uh, all international, uh, pretty much every international aid organization, every international media organization, pretty much, um, every Muslim who doesn't precisely share their views is basically an enemy. And for all those three reasons, they won't engage in conventional politics, which is one of the reasons that Al-Qaeda is opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood, be precisely because it does engage in, in, in conventional politics, precisely because it is involved in elections, which Al-Qaeda regards as being against Islam. And by the way, Al-Qaeda has also been very critical about Hamas on that issue as well. So if you take together those four strategic problems, you see why there are nobody, nobody's waving a Osama bin Laden poster in the streets of Cairo right now, because these four strategic problems have, are, are, have essentially done them in in the, in the Muslim world. And uh, I call my book The Longest War. I think The Longest War just got a lot shorter because of the events in the Middle East. Um, now, that said, um, we're all very focused on the events in the Middle East and um, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan <coughs> haven't gone away. And uh, I'll maybe talk just briefly about that. Um, before throwing it open to questions. And maybe I'll also talk a little bit about the domestic uh, Islamic radical uh, um, question because it's of such interest right now with the imminent Peter King hearings. Um, on Afghanistan and Pakistan, I think the single most underreported or underprocessed story of the last year is President Obama's decision to say that the United States will be in Afghanistan until December 2014. Uh, it has been reported, but it hasn't been processed. Do the thought experiment where um, a Republican president said, we're going to be in Afghanistan for four more years in very large numbers. Uh, I think the liberal side of the Democratic Party would be going nuts right now. Uh, in fact, it's just being met with silence because it doesn't fit with the narrative of the Nobel Peace Prize winning president who's supposedly weak on national security uh, Democratic Party. It doesn't fit with that narrative very comfortably. 
but this is a much bigger decision than the surge decision of, of 30,000 troops, which was a subject of millions of column inches and a great deal of press attention. The, the decision, the, te the 10 meetings over 10 weeks where President Obama eventually decided that he would authorize another 30,000 troops because this decision is actually authorizing 100,000 troops at four years, not 30,000 troops uh, to July of 2011, which was how that decision was presented at West Point in December of 2009 when President Obama made his big speech about Afghanistan. So that is a very big deal, and I think it was the right decision. And I was in Afghanistan in December, and I, you know, every Afghan I spoke with was very happy about it because they were extremely concerned that the United States was heading for the exits in July 2011 for multiple reasons. First of all, it didn't give, you know, July 2014, putting four years on the clock does several things. First of all, it allows other political forces to rise in Afghanistan who are not part of the Karzai Mafia to run in the presidential election of, of uh, 2014. It gives them time to organize. And there are those forces who are real, I think, Democrats and who, will, who are sort of Afghan patriots, uh, a disinterested Afghan patriots. So that's point one. Point two, it does allow for a larger and more effective Afghan national army to be, be built up. As you know, right now, it's pretty feckless. Uh, but four more years on the clock allows it to get to the point where it can be uh, uh, capable of, of defending against the Taliban. It also signals to the Pakistanis uh, that we are uh, we're there for the long term. And in fact, I was just speaking today with an Afghan official who said that in the next 90 days, Afghanistan and the United States is going to uh, come to some sort of uh, strategic framework agreement. Um, now, what quite what that means is not clear yet, but it will involve discussions of what the United States role will be 2015 and, and later. So, you know, just as we're in Okinawa 60 years after the end of World War II, we're going to be in Afghanistan, and rightly so, uh, for a very long time. After all, uh, our national interests uh, are pretty high there in terms of not wanting uh, uh, the Taliban to come back and Al-Qaeda with them. Um, it also signals to the Taliban something quite important, which is they've been saying to their guys, look, uh, July 2011, um, he's, the United States is heading for the exits. Now they've got to explain, and we know from detainee interviews, that, uh, that oh, well, four more years is actually quite a long time. And it's very, very interesting to me that, pardon me, it's very interesting to me when, we, when we've got um, completely independent assessments of the U.S. military making some of the same points as the U.S. military. When the U.S. military says, uh, that the, the, the Taliban have taken big hits in Helmand and Kandahar. I don't disbelieve it, but, I, <laughs> but I'm much more tempted to uh, believe it when I see a group like ICOFS, which is a, uh, Afghan, an Afghan NGO based in Afghanistan, long critical Western policy in the country, which is making the same point in the report just recently. I'm much more tempted to believe it when Carlotta Gore, who's been uh, based in Afghanistan on and off for 20 years, and I think you know, he's arguably, the, uh, not arguably, he's the dean of American, in fact, all Western reporters in Afghanistan, when she writes that she's in Kandahar and you know, the Taliban have taken, uh, have, have abandoned certain districts like Arden Zab and Zari, I believe it. When Carlotta Gore interviews mid-level Taliban commanders and said, we're very, you know, we're really feeling the heat, I also believe that. And so I think that we're beginning to see not just U.S. military assertions that, in, that the Taliban have taken big hits in Helmand and Kandahar, but also independent confirmation of that fact. Um, you know, the big question, of course, is Pakistan. And, um, it, you know, I don't think the Pakistanis are ever going to go into North Waziristan uh, because if I was General Kiani, I wouldn't either. At the end of the day, uh, Pakistan's national interests and ours, of course, do not align very well. Uh, they, have, they align much more, they have aligned much more in the past, sorry, they've aligned much more today than they have in the past. So for instance, three or four years ago, if you said that the Pakistanis would do a serious military operation in southern Waziristan against the Taliban, that they would do a serious military operation against the Taliban in SWAT, basically, I think nobody in this room would have believed it necessarily, and I wouldn't have believed it either. Now, um, the southern Waziristan operation uh, and the South SWAT operation were serious military operations done with a good deal of public support by the Pakistani public. But I, d I don't see the Pakistani military having the will, perhaps even the capabilities, but certainly the will to go after the Haqqani network in, in North Waziristan for the foreseeable future. Um, so that is a problem. Secondly, Pakistan is likely to have a 25% inflation rate next year, up from 15% this year. Uh, the politicians are not prepared to take the, make the difficult uh, 
decisions about how to deal with that. That would involve ending fuel subsidies, food subsidies, lots of things that are very, would be politically very unpopular. Um, and as you know, in Pakistan, the political leadership is pretty weak. We've seen now two cabinet ministers being assassinated because they, you know, e just even discussed the idea of uh, in some way reshaping the blasphemy law. Um, and so I don't want to say that Pakistan is uh, in, in terrible shape because predictions of Pakistan's uh, sort of imminent demise have been historically inaccurate. Pakistan has lost or drawn three and a half wars with India. It's lost half its territory in 1971, the Bangladesh uh, war. Uh, you know, it's gone through a lot. Uh, but the fact is, is that the that Pakistani safe haven isn't necessarily going to go away over time. Um, and so that, 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 is, that is a problem. Uh, the drones are only uh, a partial solution uh, to the Al-Qaeda problem. Um, I can discuss that in more detail in the Q&A if you're interested. Um, so those were sort of, sort of some overall observations about uh, kind of what's going on right now and some of the themes of the book. And just on the note, on the question of um, kind of a greens under the bed idea that I think pr pr Representative King has been sort of suggesting that um, Islamic communities aren't, com aren't cooperating with law enforcement is one of the principal things that he's looking into on the hearings on Thursday. Uh, I don't think that's true. And I think uh, without getting into a lot of detail, uh, New America Foundation will release a report in the next 24 hours or so that brings a lot of data to this question of to what extent have Muslim communities cooperated with law enforcement. And uh, we also, uh, just to give you one or two little nuggets from that, which are interesting, we looked at 177 jihadist terrorist, terrorism cases since 9-11, charge, charges or convictions. Uh, of these 177 cases, not one involved chemical, biological, nuclear, or radiological weapons, which is not something that would have been easily predictable post 9-11 and the anthrax attacks. I devote a chapter in the book to something what I call Al-Qaeda's exotic quest for weapons of mass destruction. Um, and there is some real good news, which is Al-Qaeda, you know, these guys are not nuclear scientists. We know from uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq and Iran that actually having, a, you know, developing a nuclear weapon is enormously complex and very expensive. Even developing, re even developing effective biological weapons is extremely difficult. Think about Bruce Ivins, who the FBI identified as the man behind the the anthrax attacks, he was one of the world's leading microbiologists and he only killed five people. So imagine how difficult it is for a terrorist like Mohammed Atta, the 9-11 hijacker, to suddenly turn himself into a leading microbiologist. It's just not gonna happen. What we do need to be concerned about is microbi microbiologists becoming jihadists. That is a lot much, so what we're looking for, what we should be concerned about is an Islamist Bruce Ivan, um, but we shouldn't be concerned about terrorists um, um, being being involved in weapons of mass destruction. It's very, very hard, and there's very little evidence. And, and the evidence that exists of Al-Qaeda had amateur uh, investigations of anthrax, but never acquired pathogenic anthrax. As you know, anthrax is, is naturally occurring. Uh, they experimented with ricin, which is not a weapon of mass destruction. It's an assassination tool. But they never got very far with any of this. Uh, and so uh, as part of the kind of good news section of this uh, discussion, or the fears about terrorist arms with weapons of mass destruction have turned turn out to be uh, quite overwrought. The huge caveat to that is the sort of a Moore's law in biology is, I, I'm not a biologist, but uh, Moore's law you're all familiar with in computing terms, but there is now Moore's law perhaps with biology, which things that would have been very hard to do even 10 years ago, now uh, somebody with a graduate level bio uh, might be able to do. Uh, so. Um, Thankfully, very few of the terrorists that we know who've been involved in anti-Western attacks have actually had a biological degree. I can only think of one, uh, somebody in Jamaa Islamiyah who was involved in the Bali attack, uh, uh, had a bio uh, degree in biology. Uh, so that's, that's a big caveat. But um, that said, uh, it would have been very hard to predict that 10 years after 9-11 that we wouldn't really have had a single instance of a serious biological, chemical, nuclear, radiological attack in the United States. After all, somebody like Graham Allison who, well known to all of you, uh, predicted in 2004 that there would be a nuclear attack on the United States by terrorists uh, in 10 years. We're now, uh, you know, uh, we're only three years away from 2014 and there's no evidence for any of, any of that. So with that, I'll take any questions.